Can we open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 6? We've got a short but glorious passage to take a look at together, and so I want to pray before we begin. Father in heaven, I pray that you give us now the grace and the ability to look at your word, to embrace it with all of our heart, and to receive your goodness among us now this morning. We believe, Lord, that we can only be what you want us to be in this community. We can only reach what you've called us to reach in this world if we receive from you what you have to give us. We can only give unto others what you have done unto us. And so, Father, we pray that you would come and minister unto us, your people, now to truly equip us to serve you with our lives and in this world. Amen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, John chapter 6, we're going to begin at verse 14 this morning. And when we last left it in the Gospel of John, because that's what we're doing on Sundays, we're going verse by verse through the Gospel of John. And when we last left it on Sunday morning, Jesus had just fed 5,000 miraculously. Do, do you remember that? With five loaves and two fish, and they weren't big loaves and they weren't big fish. Jesus miraculously said, and we call it the feeding of the 5,000, but actually it was much more than that because it was 5,000 men. We don't know in addition how many women and children were there, but we just typically call it the feeding of the 5,000. But whether it was 7,000 or 10,000 friends, it was a remarkable miracle that Jesus took the care and concern to meet people's material needs and to just love on them in that way. And so that's what he did. In this miraculous and beautiful way, he fed the 5,000. But immediately after that, look what happens beginning at verse 14. Ready? Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. In other words, those who saw this amazing miracle that Jesus did of feeding so many people with such a little supply of food... When they saw it and when they understood that it was a miracle, because maybe they didn't even understand at the beginning it was a miracle. Maybe they thought that there was some great catering operation going on from some business locally or something. But when they understood that this was a miraculous provision, it got their attention. They saw the sign that Jesus did. And what did they say? They say, truly, this is the prophet. Now, they were remembering something from the Old Testament, specifically the book of Deuteronomy. Moses promised that there would come a prophet after him who was like him and that the people should listen to him. This, of course, Moses was prophetically announcing Jesus Christ centuries before Jesus would come. But the people made that connection. Oh, the prophet who is to come, he's going to be like Moses. And when they said, how is he going to be like Moses? Well, one of the things Moses did or was used of God to do in the wilderness was to feed the people miraculously with manna. And there were people in that time who taught rabbis and that time and following who taught that when the Messiah came again, he would reinstitute the giving of manna. And they said, this is it. This is the guy. He's a walking bread factory and fish processing plant. We, we got everything we need right from this man. Look at him. He has what we need. This is the prophet that Moses told us about. We are ready to follow him. Now, friends, I want you to understand something. There's something subtle but powerful here. They were excited about Jesus and willing to receive him as a prophet... Why? Because of what he gave to them. Jesus, you put bread and fish in my belly. It tasted really good, and I am satisfied. I recognize you as the prophet from God. Now, friends, that's not a bad thing, but I want you to understand there's a danger in that. Here's the danger that comes down to you and I in our walk with God right here and now. The danger is simply this, that we only love Jesus and we are only attracted to him for what he gives us. Now, I, I feel funny when I say that. I almost want to catch those words as they come out of my mouth. Because, friends, Jesus loves you. And he wants to give to you. 
and he wants to bless you and pour out his goodness upon your life. But do you understand that it is a dangerous trap to only love Jesus for what he gives you? It's a dangerous trap to love the gift more than the giver. And I just want to call us back to this recognition all over again. That there is an aspect of our love and devotion and obedience to Jesus that we owe to him and that that belongs to him just because he's God, just because he's Lord. It wouldn't matter if he gave or didn't give us anything. Now, I, I say that not to tell you not to expect Jesus to be wonderful in your life. He does want to be wonderful in life. But I ask you simply to separate that in your mind and to have this kind of devotion unto Jesus that will say, Jesus, at the end of the day, it's because of who you are that I love you. It is because of who you are that I surrender my life to you. And what you give me is beautiful and I praise you for it. But it's not as if you failed to provide bread for me miraculously, then I'm going to turn my back on you. In any regard, let's go to verse 15. We read this. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Friends, did you read that in verse 15? They were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Now make no mistake about it, king was a political title. This crowd was willing to support Jesus simply because they wanted to use him to throw off the oppression of the Roman government that lorded over them. And they said, this man has the goods. He has supernatural power. He's the prophet Moses spoke of. This is the guy. Let, let, let's attach ourselves to him and let's make him the king that we have longed for. Friends, I don't know about you, but there are many people who would react as if that thing came to them. They, if they were in Jesus' sandals, they would say something like this, praise the Lord. You know, I, I really want to reach the Jewish people, and now not only do they embrace me, but they embrace me as king. What could be better than that? Jesus regarded this as a temptation from the devil. I don't want any part of it, he said. And what did he do? Look at verse 15. It says, he departed again to a mountain by himself alone. Jesus was not impressed by the adoration of the crowd. He wasn't seduced that the crowd wanted to make him king. Instead, as I said before, he regarded this as a temptation from the devil. And he said, no, I will not do it. He turned his back on the crowd. And what did he do? He went off into an isolated place by himself to pray. Do you understand that Jesus was more impressed with being with his father than with hearing the applause from the crowd? Friends, that, that is a man from heaven. That is a man with the proper priorities. And so Jesus came with that attitude, no, I'm not going to buy in to the adulation of the crowd. I have a mission from my father in heaven that I will fulfill. Now with that in mind, look at verse 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over to the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. So Jesus, after this, now by the way, this is a miracle that we're going to read about in the coming verses that is recorded in three Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and here in the Gospel of John. And actually, it's one of those miracles where each Gospel writer fills in details in different ways. So what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to bring in a few details from some of the other Gospels. For example, the Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus compelled his disciples to get in the boat. He made them. You guys, get out of here. I have a theory, I can't prove it, but it seems logical to me, that Jesus was worried that his disciples were catching the fervor of the crowd. King Jesus, now! King Jesus now, King Jesus now. Jesus says, whoa, this isn't in God's timing. This isn't in God's way. Not only am I going to separate myself from the crowds, but you disciples, you get out of here as well. I'm going to send you across the lake, the Sea of Galilee. I want you to go. And so Jesus put him in the boat. He compelled them to leave. It was already getting dark, verse 17 says. Verse 17 also says that Jesus had not come to them. By the way, can I mention to you? 
that in the chronology of the Gospels, this is already the second time Jesus will have a remarkable experience with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. In a previous incident on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus was with them in the boat, sleeping. Do you remember that one? Jesus was asleep in the boat. A storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples were panicked. What did they wake Jesus saying? They said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus got up and what did he do? He rebuked the storm and everything became calm. Now this is a second and separate incident on the Sea of Galilee. Please note that the disciples get into the boat without Jesus. Jesus is going off on his own to pray somewhere. He sends the disciples off on a boat to go across the Sea of Galilee and he will meet up with them at a later time. This is the second incident on the Sea of Galilee, but but there's similarities between the two. If you look at verse 18, it says, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Friends, I don't need to get into the whole geography of the land of Israel, even though it's a fascinating subject. But I will tell you this, that the Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level. 600 feet below sea level. And it's not all that far from the Mediterranean Sea. So when storm fronts come from the west over the Mediterranean Sea and sweep over the hills and come down to the Sea of Galilee, they produce violent winds that whip up this relatively small lake in a very fast and vicious way. This is known to this present day. Now, on some of the several tours of Israel, I've been out on some stormy seas of Galilee, and it's always exciting, and everybody's, well, who's going to walk on the water? Who's going to calm the sea? On and on. Listen, we just say, keep chugging the boat along, Captain, and we'll be just fine. I've never been on big waves on the Sea of Galilee, but I have been in the midst of a hailstorm on the Sea of Galilee, and that was pretty fun, but I didn't have the faith to get up and calm the storm or anything. (laughs) But please remember, here... The disciples are in the boat, Jesus is not with them, and a big storm comes upon the Sea of Galilee. Now, I I do want to remind you of one other thing, that several of the disciples were experienced fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. It's not as if these were purely landlubbers who knew nothing about a boat. I'm sure some of them were unfamiliar, but there was enough on board. They knew what they were doing on the boat. But notice this, the sea arose, a great wind was blowing, verse 19, so when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. Jesus, you told us to go across the lake. Okay, Jesus, we're going to obey you. Everybody get in the boat. Let's go across. The wind starts blowing. Oh, the wind is blowing too far, too fast. We're going into the wind. We're traveling in the direction that the wind is coming from. The sails are no good. Guys, take down the sails. Let's get to rowing and let's row in the midst of a strong wind. Now, rowing requires that the disciples work together, which wasn't something that it seems they did all that well. There they are rowing against the wind, straining, giving every muscle. They've been working all through the night because they got in there just as it was evening. And this experience won't end until dawn. They're rowing for hours and hours through a very stiff wind. They're straining at the oars. There's calluses or blisters upon their hands. Their muscles have strained. And when they have rowed about three or four hours and hadn't made it very far across the lake, what happens? Jesus appeared to them. Now, I know the text says that they were afraid, and they were. But I think the disciples were dealing with something else in this instance that we need to be aware of. And it's simply this. Not only were they afraid, they were frustrated. Have you ever worked really hard at something and not made much progress? I know what that's like. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what it's like, symbolically speaking, of course, to row hard through the night and not make it very far across the lake. Now, you know what this is like with your life. You know what it is to invest a lot into something, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a business, whether it's an educational degree, whether it's a project, it could even be a hobby, but you invest a lot into it, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, and the frustration comes to you that it doesn't seem like you have accomplished very much. And friends, they were in this place of frustration, I want to remind you, and they were also completely in the will of Jesus. Why were they in the boat at all? Because Jesus told them to be. 
do you realize that you may be in a very frustrating place in your life right now? You may be, to use the metaphor, straining at the oars, pressing against the wind, and still be completely in the will of Jesus in your life. That's a hard word for some people to hear because you somehow got the impression, maybe nobody told it to you in these words, you just picked it up along the way, that if you were really in God's will, everything would be easy. Anybody ever get that? Now listen, I'm happy when it's easy. I thank God when it's easy. But friends, there are times when Jesus calls us to do something that he knows is gonna be frustrating, that he knows is gonna require a stretch or a strain or a particular effort for us, and he has ordained it. Now, this is something else that I want you to know, and we know this from the Gospel of Mark, that all the while, while the disciples are straining at those oars, while their muscles are aching and cramping, the sweat is coming down their face, their hands are becoming bloodied, all that while, Jesus was up on the hill watching them, praying for them. Isn't that a beautiful figure? There you are in the midst of whatever strain it is. You're terribly frustrated. You feel like giving up. What's especially bothering to you is you feel like you haven't made much progress and you wonder, Jesus, where are you in the midst of this? I tell you, he's watching, he's loving, he's caring, and he's praying for you. You are under his constant supervision throughout all of it, just as the disciples were. And then at the right time, no earlier, no later, but at the right time, what did Jesus do? He said, I think I'm gonna go down there and check in on them. And he goes for a little walk down the mountain and in the way that only Jesus could. Well, no, let me take that back. Only Jesus and Peter for a few steps. But the only way that Jesus could walk on the water and come out to them. And it caught them completely by surprise. Did you see that in verse 19? They saw Jesus walking on the sea and they were afraid. Instead of saying, Jesus, thank you for finally coming. They were afraid. And you know why I think they were afraid? Because they were not prepared. They were not ready for supernatural help to come to them. Friends, I I want us to be ready when supernatural help comes our way. Are are you ready for the fact that God may send help to you in a very unexpected supernatural way? This is how it came to the disciples, and they were afraid. They did not seem ready for it. Now, one other thing I want to add to this. They had just come from the feeding of the 5,000. What was left over from the feeding of the 5,000? Lots of bread in big baskets surely some of those baskets were in the boat. Did not Jesus give them reason to believe in his supernatural power and care and provision? Friends, the baskets of bread were right there in the boat. They could have said, you know what, this is really hard, but we're doing what Jesus told us to do, and the bread's right there. He's a miracle-working Savior. We can trust in him. As long as we're obeying him, we're doing the right thing, we can relax with that. Instead, they are afraid and frustrated. And this is just something I want you to consider right now. I I don't think that God has given you a basket of bread left over from the feeding of the 5,000. He hasn't given you that literally, but but perhaps metaphorically he's given you that. Has not God given you some reason to believe that's right in front of your face? I'm not saying that, that somebody couldn't say, oh, well, what about that? But no, you know it in your own heart. God's given you some reason to believe, some reason to trust him, something right in front of your face that says, hey, this is it. You can trust me. You can believe. I've come, before, I've come, for, uh, I've come through for you before. I can come through for you again. Verse 20, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. All Jesus had to do was announce his presence. I am here Do not be afraid. And he came to bring that supernatural help, that supernatural comfort to his disciples. His presence gave them what they needed, even though he came to them in a very unexpected way. And friends, when Jesus reveals himself in the storm and says, here I am in the midst of you, and he says, do not be afraid, don't you need to hear that? I mean, isn't that God's divine word for somebody here? Even if it's just one person, I'm delighted to deliver that message. Do not be afraid. Jesus is with you. Hallelujah. Just stop it. Stop being afraid. You, you, you're not feeling afraid right now because ho- hopefully you're distracted. You're distracted either by what I'm saying or, or you're distracted by your lunch plans this afternoon. But whatever it is, you're distracted. But when your mind comes to rest, the fear kicks up all over again. 
Friends, would you let your mind rest on Jesus instead of your fears? Because whatever it was about the storm and all the circumstances around them, the reality of Jesus right there in their presence was something greatest. And they said, yes, I cannot be afraid any longer. I can trust in that. And matter of fact, we know from the Gospel of Matthew that it was after this, John doesn't get into it, so we're not going to get into it, but it was after this that John, excuse me, that Peter said to Jesus, if it's you, Lord, then let me get out of the boat and walk to you. That is one of the most mind-blowing passages in the New Testament. And we as preachers, we love to kind of make Peter our whipping boy. You know, oh, Peter, you've done it again, on and on. But Peter walked on the water for a few steps because his eyes were on Jesus. In any regard, that's in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's take a look at how this ends here, at least in the passage we're going to look at this morning. Verse 21. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Notice the order here. Verse, first, verse 21. Then they willingly received him into the boat. Friends, I can't, I can't tell you how this impresses me about Jesus. That rarely, I will not say never, but rarely does Jesus impose his presence upon a person. He would not even demand to get into the boat when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee. He was like, guys, do you want me to come in? If you will willingly receive me, then I will come in and I will commandeer your situation. You know, I, I don't know what some of us are waiting for. Some of us are waiting for Jesus to make us trust him. And don't you see that Jesus says, look, here I am. Will you willingly receive me into the situation? Now, I'm not saying that Jesus never imposes himself. Sometimes he does. And I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't have the right to impose himself. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. But isn't it interesting that his pattern so often is to come up alongside us and say, will you invite me into this situation? I'm here if you'll invite me. Will you willingly receive me into the boat? And you can just imagine, the boat, yes, Jesus, by all means, come in. Then notice what happened, verse 21. This is the part that really blows my mind. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. I don't know if Jesus perfected hydrofoil technology before its time. Uh, this seems to be some kind of supernatural miracle. I, I, I read lots of commentators this week, and I read the ones that tried to explain it away and this and that. But friends, this just seems to be a miracle of God, that they had made their way not, not two-thirds across the lake, and then as soon as Jesus got into the boat, whoo, they were there. I don't know how it happened. If you're asking me to give like a, like a physics lesson, and how, I can't explain it. All I can know is that the God who created physics got into the boat, and when he got into it, it immediately was transported right to the place where they were going to go. And here's the point. All that work, all that frustration, the sore muscles, the bloodied hands, the sweat on their brow, wouldn't it be easy to say for the disciples, what a waste. Why didn't Jesus just get in the boat when they launched off and then, whoom, get them over to the other side? But friends, don't you see that's not how Jesus worked? There was something for them to gain in every strained muscle, in every bloody blister, in every drop of sweat. This wasn't just about getting across the lake. This was about training the disciples in obedience. And I bet Jesus was so pleased, so pleased when he saw these guys are sweating to obey me, even in the frustration, even when it's difficult. Uh, now that I've seen this, I'm just going to reward them, but I'll take it the rest of the way. Let's get to our destination like that. See, it wasn't just about crossing the lake. It was about what God was going to do in the midst of of his disciples, and that remarkable miracle, I believe, was especially meaningful to the disciples for this reason. Please remember, many of them signed up to follow Jesus because they believed he was Messiah the King. Jesus had just turned down an offer to be recognized as Messiah the King. Would you blame some of the disciples for having a few doubts about Jesus right about now? Wait a minute, I thought he was king, I thought he was Messiah, but yet now he just turned it down. What's going on? I don't really get this. Jesus was saying to them loud and clear through a miraculous journey on a boat. Uh, I don't know, a, a mile and a half in 10 seconds. 
by a remarkable journey on a boat, Jesus was saying, you guys don't have to be afraid. I am exactly who I say I am. Trust me along the way. I am King Jesus. I am the God who guides you. And friends, if I could just draw one more analogy here. Isn't this what it's going to be like for us when we go to heaven? Aren't we toiling on the journey along the way? And friends, it's work. It's work, it's trouble, it's some hardship until we get to heaven. Here we are toiling in the journey on the way. We got the bloody hands and the strained muscles and the sweaty brow, and we toil along the way. But friends, the moment we pass from this life to the next, immediately our boat is at the destination. And we are there. And we are there forever with our Lord at his appointed harbor for us. And we can trust in that all along the way. And the good point is that Jesus is with us in the boat all along. Even when he's not physically up there, it's in the boat. He's watching us from afar, praying for us, caring for us, loving us from afar. Friends, it's Jesus' journey from beginning to end. We take such peace, such confidence in that. Now, Jesus gave them reason to believe. I mentioned that before. The baskets of bread there in the boat. They had reason to believe. You've been miraculous and faithful before. You'll be miraculous and faithful again. I want you to know that there might be somebody here. You say, you know what, David, maybe everybody else, God's given them some reason to believe. He hasn't given me reason to believe. Ah, I'm glad you're here. Because we're going to give you reason to believe right now. We're going to come to the table of communion. And we're going to pass trays that have pieces of bread on them. And we're going to pass trays that have cups on them. And we're going to ask you to take a piece of bread. We'll take it together. Then we'll ask you to take a cup and we'll take it together. And friends, here's the point. That bread, that cup, that is your reason to believe. It is what God has given you in a material sense to show you the spiritual work that Jesus did for you on the cross by laying down his body and pouring out his blood. And he says, I want you to receive it and I will give you reason to believe. Something material that'll be in your hand. And this is open to all who will receive the bread and the cup in faith. Friends, if you have no belief in Jesus or no belief in what he did for you on the cross, then let it pass by. But if you will receive it in faith, you are welcome to participate at the table of communion with us. I'm going to pray right now. The worship team's going to come forward. The ushers are going to come forward. And we're going to partake of communion together. Let's pray together now. Father in heaven, Lord, I, I want to pray very pointedly right now for those who feel a high level of frustration and futility in their life. Lord, they've worked, they've strained, they've tried, they feel like there's nothing left. Jesus, I pray that especially those in our midst, you would assure them right now of your love, your presence, your care, your concern for them. And Jesus, we want to believe you right now and ask that you prepare our hearts as we receive a reason to believe. The bread and the cup that we share with together to remember the great work that Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that you prepare us for this. In Jesus' name.